So uh, over the next 30 minutes or so, I thought I would just show you a few key examples that I think are important that you might encounter in your offices or obviously up in the hospital. And cer certainly this is not meant to be a conclusive representation or comprehensive representation of electrocardiography, but I thought maybe some uh, take home points here. This is an example of hyperkalemia in a renal failure patient taken care of by one of our nephrologists. And I think the underlying story here is it's important as an office-based practitioner or in the hospital to recognize electrolyte abnormalities because the electrocardiogram may be the first indicator of an electrolyte abnormality. Typically, this pertains to calcium and potassium disorders. Potassium affecting initially the T wave, as in this case, with a peaked symmetric T wave with a narrow base. Notice that the T wave amplitude may not be all that high, but in fact, it's more the symmetry and the narrow based portion of the T wave that's most important. In addition, in more uh, pronounced cases of hyperkalemia, you can have QRS complex duration prolongation. You can have PR interval prolongation as well. With hypokalemia, you will see a prominent uh, T wave and often a prolonged QTU segment because the U wave gains more prominence. In calcium disorders, it'll typically affect the QT interval and spare the QRS complex per se and the PR interval. This next particular patient is an example of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and ventricular preexcitation. And the take home message here is sure, the PR interval is short. Uh, you can see that the PR interval is short in all leads. There's a delayed upstroke to the QRS complex, and that delayed upstroke reflects early activation of the ventricle down the accessory pathway. It, what you want to be careful of here is uh, interpreting an agent-determinant myocardial infarction. So some people might want to uh, identify the inferior leads as having prominent fairly long duration Q waves supporting an agent determinant inferior myocardial infarction, but that's where you can get into trouble. In fact, the accessory pathway conduction is opposite the inferior leads in this case. So you're getting an initial negative uh, QRS complex deflection due to the fact that the accessory pathway vector is away from the inferior lead. So in this case, you'd want to steer away from an agent determinant myocardial infarction, but instead stick with the accessory pathway. This patient may in fact have coronary artery disease, but that would be, you'd have to rely on another test to make that diagnosis. This particular patient does have coronary artery disease. While I can't conclusively tell you that the patient has coronary artery disease based on the electrocardiogram, there is a hint here. First of all, he's being taken care of by an interventional cardiologist. That, that always helps, but not all of you are from Cleveland Clinic, so you may not know that. This patient demonstrates normal sinus rhythm with complete right bundle branch block. That's a fairly routine finding on an electrocardiogram and is very nonspecific. So what is somewhat more specific regarding coronary artery disease? Well, look at the T waves in leads V1 and V2. They are actually positive or concordant with the QRS complex. That is abnormal in the setting of complete right bundle branch block. That is an example of a primary T wave change in the setting of complete right bundle branch block and suggests the possibility of posterior circulation abnormalities. And in fact, this patient had a dominant left circumflex which had been occluded and the patient had a prior posterior myocardial infarction. Is it diagnostic from this electrocardiogram? No. Is it suggested that there may be a problem? Yes, based on the T wave and QRS complex concordance. So when you see this, it should raise your attention to the possibility of a posterior circulatory problem and I think you should do more investigation. More investigation is subject to discussion. It might certainly would include a history and physical. And if there's any uh, concern, particularly in terms of their aggregate cardiac risk factors, you might consider some sort of cardiac stress imaging. This is a patient with sinus rhythm, maybe borderline first degree atrial ventricular block and complete left bundle branch block. And this patient had profound left ventricular systolic dysfunction on a non-ischemic basis. The patient had a heart cath which demonstrated normal coronary arteries. There is some correlation between the duration of the QRS complex and the level of degree of LV dysfunction. The wider the QRS complex suggests and somewhat correlates with more profound left ventricular systolic dysfunction, provided the patient's not on any antiarrhythmic poisons such as amiodarone or something else, which also can prolong the QRS complex. Why am I showing this EKG? Because it's basically complete left bundle branch block, which you've all seen. Well, there's inferior Q waves and leads three in AVF. And we have to know that both the strengths and limitations of any test. With regard to electrocardiography, 
it's not really a good idea, it's not permissible to code an agent determinant myocardial infarction in the presence of complete left bundle branch block. If you think about it, the left ventricle is depolarized last. It's the right ventricle that's depolarized first, and then there's right to left ventricular depolarization. Depolarization is slowed, entry is first into the distal conduction system, and therefore the Kuros complex is displayed extremely aberrantly, and there's not a prompt initial reflection of left ventricular events. Given the lack of uh, visualization or ability to interpret prompt left ventricular events, the inferior Q waves really are, are uh, out of bounds. There, you really shouldn't derive any conclusions from those. You might notice that a patient has a somewhat a left third axis, but even in lead two, the curious complex is positive. So I would leave this alone and say sinus rhythm, first degree AV block, complete left bundle branch block, and the inferior Q, Q waves are not informative in this particular instance. This next patient actually does demonstrate findings where you can diagnose uh, an agent determinate myocardial infarction. This patient uh, demonstrates sinus rhythm rate may be slightly greater than 60 per minute. Uh, the PR interval is markedly prolonged, greater than 200 milliseconds. The QRS complex vector is positive in lead one and negative in leads two, three, and AVF. So the patient has left anterior hemiblock. There's no evidence of an agent determinate inferior myocardial infarction because R waves are still present in leads two, three, and AVF. So we're gonna stick with left anterior fascicular block. There is a QR pattern, QR, R prime pattern in leads V1 and lead V2. The QRS complex is delayed. So that looks like a complete right bundle branch block because the QRS complex is at 120 milliseconds or longer. So this patient actually has first degree AV block, left anterior fascicular block, and complete right bundle branch block. If they had syncope, this would be a patient who you'd send to Fred Jager or one of our electrophysiologists. This patient also has coronary artery disease, again cared for by Dr. Whitlow, one of my interventional colleagues. Notice the Q waves in leads V2 and V3. So we had complete left bundle branch block. We couldn't derive any conclusions about Q waves because the left ventricle is depolarized late. In complete right bundle branch block, the left ventricle is actually depolarized early. It's a depolarized first, so there's no superimposed right ventricular events with left ventricular depolarization. And you see what, what I consider a more pure electrical reflection on the surface EKG of left ventricular events. And this patient actually demonstrates an agent determinate anteroceptal or anteroceptal myocardial infarction because it looks like V4 may be spared. So this patient does have coronary artery disease, and you can make that determination in the presence of complete right bundle branch block because the left ventricle is depolarized initially. Here's a patient, it'd be unlikely for them to walk in your office, perhaps in the hospital or perhaps in the emergency room. This patient has a hemodynamically significant pericardial effusion. This patient has diffuse low voltage QRS and the concept of electrical alternants. I think you can all see that each, every other QRS complex demonstrates a differing but regular amplitude. So there's, ver, there's regularization to this every other QRS complex amplitude. There's diffuse low voltage QRS, somewhat rightward axis, and this patient had unfortunately a metastatic malignancy including a large pericardial effusion. This should not be confused with what we see as the respiratory variation on an electrocardiogram where it might be more like this in terms of its variation. It's not in every other variation, but you might see a slight variation of QRS complex amplitude as the patient takes a deep breath and then exhales. This is a patient actually with a ventricular pacemaker. Ventricular pacemakers can be tricky to see on an electrocardiogram. However, there is a small uh, discrete deflection before each QRS complex supporting the presence of a ventricular pacemaker. Notice that the QRS complex is uh, negative and leads 2, 3, and AVF. And also it's a left bundle branch block morphology. The, the ventricular pacemaker lead is in the right ventricular apex. So that, by definition, is going to give you a left bundle branch block morphology because the right ventricle is being depolarized first. Remember, this is a, not a biventricular pacemaker, pacemaker. We're pacing the right ventricular apex. So we get a left bundle branch block morphology. Since we're pacing the apex, it's going to be apical to base depolarization opposite what normal depolarization is. So that means you're actually activating the heart away from the inferior leads toward the uh, upper aspects of the heart, so maybe toward AVL and lead one. So from, base to, from apex to base, and that's why you get the negative QRS complex in leads two, three, and AVF away from those leads. Now, I wouldn't have shown you this EKG just solely for that. 
This patient also has retrograde atrial activation. So if in fact you see, uh, say let's look at the lead V1 rhythm strip, you can see retrograde P waves within the ST segment. And that means that there's retrograde ventriculoatrial depolarization. The atria are actually contracting against closed mitral and tricuspid valves. In, those, in that circumstance, patients can actually present with exertional intolerance, shortness of breath, fatigue, and this can be equated with the, at least the electrocardiogram presence of the pacemaker syndrome. So this is a type of patient, if you have a patient who's not thriving, doing poorly for one reason or another, and has an electrocardiogram that looks like this, they need to be referred to your pacemaker clinic because reprogramming of their pacemaker is indicated. This is actually an interesting EKG. It's an interesting coronary artery disease pattern that you don't see all that frequently. So this patient has, let's say, sinus rhythm at rate of around 60, 65 per minute. Notice that there's a prominent R wave in lead V1. The R wave is greater than the S wave in lead V1. That suggests the possibility of posterior uh, territory pathology. Well, is there something else on, the, on this electrocardiogram that supports that finding? Well, there's Q waves in leads 1 and AVL, and that's the high lateral leads. So the high lateral leads appear to be in, affected. The posterior leads may be affected. And notice also in leads V5 and V6, you actually demonstrate R wave regression with the presence of Q waves. So this is an example actually of a posterolateral and highlateral myocardial infarction, almost certainly the left circumflex coronary artery distribution. Notice the prominent R waves in leads 2, 3, and AVF. This does not support right coronary involvement, but instead a posterolateral and highlateral infarction that you may see with circumflex disease, and not a terribly common electrocardiogram, but one that you may run across, uh, run across over time. This is more of a show and tell. This is an electrocardiographic example of a patient with a secundum atrial septal defect. And again, if you see a lot of primary care patients in your high volume practice, the, the patient may be asymptomatic, particularly if they're in a younger age group. The um, left to right shun isn't all that um, significant. But this is an example of an atrial septal defect. Is it diagnostic? No. Is it highly suggestive? Yes. I'm not really into pattern recognition when trying to uh, educate uh, colleagues regarding electrocardiograms, but this is one of those cases where you should recognize the pattern. Notice in lead V1, which I would consider the money lead here, the somewhat unusual appearing delayed double positive inscription of the QRS complex. This, this reflects in this particular case initially um, left ventricular and then followed by delayed right ventricular depolarization, so sort of a double QRS complex, not classic for a complete or incomplete right bundle branch block but indicative of right ventricular conduction delay due to a left to right shunt, right ventricular enlargement and dilatation, and slowed right ventricular depolarization. If you critically look at leads V4, V5, and V6, you can, you can see that there's somewhat of a terminal S wave delay there as well, and that's also indicative of right ventricular depolarization, which is slowed. If you think about it, lead V6 is the extreme left ventricle. So if there's delayed right ventricular depolarization, it's gonna be very far away from lead V6, and it's gonna be delayed. And that's why it's a negative de delayed inscription on this electrocardiogram. So keep in mind um, lead V1, and if you run across that pattern, take a good history, do a physical, and consider a transthoracic echocardiogram if your suspicions are reasonably high. And that transthoracic echo would be with uh, intravenous uh, saline contrast as well to look for the intracardiac shunt. The reason I'm showing this EKG is to try to distinguish between premature atrial complexes and premature ventricular complexes. And many folks would uh, be led to believe that this represents non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Well, in fact, these are premature atrial complexes with right bundle branch block aberrancy. So how do you make that distinction on this electrocardiogram? Well, if we go back to the basics, first of all, we have sinus rhythm, rate of around 60, and maybe a little bit of a leftward axis. We're positive in one, slightly negative in lead two, and negative in leads three in AVF. So we're gonna say we have a leftward axis with sinus rhythm. If you go across the EKG, what I try to do is I land on anything that looks familiar and, and that I can readily make the diagnosis of, then I try to work backwards. In this particular case is a premature atrial complex. It's preceded by a P wave, 
within the uh, T wave of the preceding uh, QRS complex. And even before that complex, there's another premature. So those are two premature atrial complexes in succession, one of which does not conduct with aberrancy. The next one does conduct with aberrancy. And those that occur three in a row actually conduct with maximal aberrancy. So going backwards, you can actually see a P wave within the T wave deforming the terminal aspect of the T wave, which precedes this atrial triplet. So this is a nice example of premature atrial complexes with aberrancy, otherwise a normal electrocardiogram with the exception of perhaps a left axis of the QRS complex. This is sort of what uh, Fred Jager just showed us with regard to what you don't want to see. This was a young woman who was uh, unfortunately very ill with some sort of malignancy, receiving chemotherapy, and had a potassium level less than three. So this is a 12-lead electrocardiogram example of torsade in a patient with a markedly prolonged QT interval, best exemplified in leads V4, V5, and C V6, where at the initial left-hand portion of the EKG, they actually demonstrate an R on T phenomena where the uh, PVC occurs on top of the T wave during the probable vulnerable period, which initiates a period or of torsade. This particular case actually is a very important EKG. If it's a little bit blurry, I apologize. This demonstrates sinus rhythm with left anterior fascicular block. Positive QRS complex in lead one, negative QRS complex vector in leads two, three, and AVF. So that's a relatively simple electrocardiogram, and most people would code this as otherwise a normal electrocardiogram. But this EKG actually shows something even more important than that, and that's called a negative U wave. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard of a negative U wave before, but let's look in leads V4, V5, and V6. Just following the T wave, you will see a negative deflection, and that's a negative U wave. And negative U waves are typically found in two circumstances. One is ischemic heart disease, and the other is left ventricular hypertrophy. This patient doesn't have uh, marked QRS complex voltage or repolarization changes to suggest uh, left ventricular hypertrophy or LV mass. And I distinctly remember this patient, even though it says Dr. Topol on the EKG. I think it was during an American College of Cardiology meeting. I was much younger. I was, of, co of course, asked to stay back for the meeting and to see one of Dr. Topol's patients. And this patient had a history of an LAD uh, angioplasty and a stent in the past and had been doing well, but over the past week or so had recurrent angina. So I saw him, and, this EK and clinically it was apparent he had angina. But I saw this EKG and I said to myself, okay, this guy's got negative U waves. I looked at his prior EKG, he didn't have one negative U waves. So these actually can be a transient finding in the presence of active ischemic heart disease. So he underwent a cath, a repeat intervention, and sure enough, I saw him in follow-up uh, about a month later, and his negative U waves had gone away. And that was about 10 years ago, and he's been my patient ever since, and he's continued to do clinically extremely well. So this is where the negative U waves can come in handy. And if you, if you read a lot of EKGs or if you see a lot of patients preoperatively, particularly in patients with, say, peripheral arterial disease, those are the patients where you'll see this. So if there's a high pretest probability for a negative U wave where, there's where you suspect coronary artery disease, take a look at leads V4, V5, and V6. There's more of these floating out there than you realize. So th this is a nice example, actually, of paying attention to the underlying atrial rhythm in the setting of ventricular pacing. Toward the right-hand portion of the EKG, hopefully everyone can see that there's a paroxysm of ventricular pacing. And then to the extreme right-hand side of the EKG, the ventricular pacing seems to go away, and in fact, the native QRS complex conduction resumes. To the left-hand side of the EKG, you see what appears to be native QRS complexes without any identifiable atrial activity. So this patient actually demonstrates atrial fibrillation with a, a variable but controlled ventricular response. In addition, there's a Q wave, at least in lead AVF, raising the likelihood of an agent-determinant inferior myocardial infarction. And then for some reason, the ventricular conduction slows, and then the pacemaker kicks in, and then toward the end, actually, the native QRS complex takes over, and the pacemaker once again becomes quiescent. In fact, the second to last QRS complex is both an intermediate paced and native QRS complex. It's what we call a pacemaker fusion complex. So that complex is partially paced, partial native conduction, and it's a hybrid between the fully paced and the non-paced complex. The important take-home message on this EKG is as follows. It's important to 
pay attention as best you can to the underlying atrial rhythm, even if the patient's ventricularly paced. Because if this patient had an appropriate CHADS-2 score and a cardioembolic risk, which was felt to be significant, of course this patient would need to be anticoagulated. So that's the, really the take-home message on this EKG. This is a calcium disorder, and one that I think I've overlooked many times, but this one I got right. This was a patient who had primary uh, hyperparathyroidism and hypercalcemia. And the finding on this EKG actually is basically no ST segment. There's a QRS complex, and then it's the T wave. And the fact that there's a lack of an ST segment suggests to me a calcium disorder, and in this case, it was profound hypercalcemia. Hypocalcemia, you'll see the opposite, a more prolonged and straightened ST segment, and the T wave is relatively spared, unlike hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. So many, many people would call this a normal EKG, including me, but the key is the lack of the ST segment should raise your suspicion for hypercalcemia. This is a patient who presented with an acute coronary syndrome. And those of you who might see patients in the emergency room or acutely in the hospital, or if you're re really unlucky in your office and someone presents like that, um, you might say, well, this looks like a relatively normal EKG, maybe a little bit of J-point elevation and leads V1, V2, V3, but the ST segments don't look too bad. They're still up concave upwards. They don't look terribly coved or anything like that. But in fact, this patient had a uh, diagonal branch of the LAD that was acutely occluded. And the only finding on this EKG that is fairly solid are the biphasic T waves, particularly in leads 1 and AVL. So if you look in lead AVL, you can see that the J point is elevated, the ST segment is a bit straightened and elevated, and the T wave demonstrates biphasic T wave inversion terminally. And that actually indicates, in this particular patient, the diagonal branch occlusion reflecting the high lateral leads. So the circumflex coronary artery is the most underrepresented coronary artery on the surface electrocardiogram. And sometimes you have to be, you have to double and triple check to look for an abnormality. It may not be present apparently, but may evolve, evolve over time. And when I use the circumflex and the diagonal interchangeably, well, I shouldn't do that for this EKG because it was the diagonal. It's oftentimes overlapping or similar territories depending on the actual coronary artery variability from one patient to the next. This is an example of pericarditis, and I think we've all seen an EKG like this, but sometimes distinguishing between pericarditis and acute coronary syndrome can be very difficult. In this particular patient, diffuse ST segment elevation and J-point elevation is seen, not contiguous to one coronary artery territory. In addition, the often um, sort of unforgotten, or excuse me, the often forgotten electrocardiogram lead is lead AVR. If you look in lead AVR, there's a special segment called the PR segment. It's not the PR interval. The PR segment is the terminal aspect of the P wave just prior to the QRS complex. And that small segment is actually elevated in this patient, PR segment. And that's the positive electrocardiographic finding, which the reciprocal being uh, PR segment depression. But if you see the PR segment elevated in lead AVR, coupled with diffuse ST segment elevation, not coinciding to one particular coronary artery distribution, and the lack of reciprocal ST depression in other leads supports pericarditis. And the most common cause of pericarditis in any major tertiary care hospital is open heart surgery. Okay. So I don't typically like to ascribe the um, electrocardiographic diagnosis of myocardial ischemia on a 12-lead electrocardiogram, but if you're going to do so, this would be the, one of the best EKGs you could do it. So this is a positive stress test at rest. Uh, unfortunately, this patient didn't make it, had a general surgery, uh, major procedure, was, I think, had some sort of perforated bowel, so went into the procedure uh, not with a very good prognosis, emerged with an even worse prognosis, and ended, and ended up uh, passing away. But at any rate, this was a profound hypotension, sepsis, anemia, whatever, you know, whatever the uh, malignant combination was. And uh, this patient ended up ruling in for a myocardial infarction. So this turned out to be a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. But I wanted to show you at least a profound, what appears to be global ischemic pattern on an electrocardiogram. Just a few more here so we can stay on time. This is a patient who uh, presented with an acute coronary syndrome. Clearly, they have inferior ST elevation and Q waves. So there's no doubt this patient's suffering from an eight, uh, acute inferior myocardial infarction. This patient also demonstrates acute right ventricular myocardial injury. 
So you might say, well, how, how, how am I able to make that assessment from a 12 lead EKG? I thought you had to do right-sided chest leads to make that determination. Well, not always. Look in lead V1. Can you see the ST segment elevation there in lead V1? Also in lead V2 to a lesser extent in lead V3. Remember the right ventricle is an anterior structure right below the sternum. So the, your best leads to look at the right ventricle are leads V1 and V2. And sometimes you will pick up acute myocardial injury of the right ventricle in the setting of an inferior injury pattern by put it, just taking a closer look at leads uh, V1 and V2. And that dramatically can change your uh, management plan. I think I'll end on this EKG. There might be a few more that you can look in your syllabus online if you'd like after the course. This patient demonstrates sinus bradycardia with complete left bundle branch block. And remember I said before, you can ma not make the diagnosis of an agent determinant myocardial infarction in complete left bundle branch block. Well, I was kind of teasing a little bit there. So let me show you the native QRS complexes. And then there's a bigeminal pattern. So this patient actually has, say, sinus rhythm, complete left bundle branch block, and ventricular bigeminy. And you can see the PVCs in the lead V1 rhythm strip have a right bundle branch block morphology. So these PVCs with a right bundle branch block morphology are coming from where? They're coming from the left ventricle. That's why they have a right bundle branch block morphology. So if we look at the PVCs that are occurring from the left ventricle, we may get some insight in terms of what's going on with initial left ventricular depolarization, if you believe that. Now, there are a few skeptics out there, I suspect, with this. But if you look, say, and lead AVF at the PVC, there's a very prominent Q wave there. And you can also see it slightly within the PVC in lead three, just to the left of it. So this patient actually had ischemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction and a prior right coronary artery territory myocardial infarction. And that is suggested but not confirmed by these left ventricular originating PVCs, right bundle branch block morphology in the presence of complete left bundle branch block. So please, we can't take this to the bank, but we can at least, it gives you some insight in terms of why this patient may be suffering from the uh, complete left bundle.